I don't know how this is going to work, but we're going to we're going to try to put my phone through this microphone. So, uh, do you guys remember last year? Um, let me see here. What is this month? Where are we at? We're in October. Last July, my truck got stolen. Last July, my one-ton truck got truck got stolen. I was mad as a hornet. I was going through a rough time. Um, but I do remember crying about it in front of all my brothers and sisters, specifically on Wednesdays nights. And, um, but I also remember as I was going through that, we prayed for the guy that stole my truck, that the Lord would save his soul. That, you know, if, if, a, if a guy was in a bad enough spot that he needs to be stealing trucks and whatnot, you know, that the, that the Lord would capture him, that the Lord would arrest him. Not so much that the authorities would arrest him. I mean, I really wanted that too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but that the Lord would arrest this individual and save his soul. This message came to me uh, yesterday, and I'm just going to do my best. I don't know if I can put it in the speaker or not, but I'm going to try. So this is from one of my good buddies, uh, Justin Bell, gave me a call yesterday at 4 o'clock, and he left me a message. That's odd, because Justin doesn't leave me messages. <laughs> and I thought, huh, what's this saying? So this is what it said. Ready? Hey, dude. I wanted to tell you how good God is. So the guy that stole your truck and ran it till the wheels fell off or whatever, and your fishing poles in the back or whatever, anyways, he's in Cass County Jail for doing that. And Mike just led him to Jesus. <laughs> I stopped it short, you know, because, uh, you know, guys in jail, you know, stuff thing. <laughs> but that just really blessed my heart. Uh, that just really blessed me yesterday. You know, I don't know the guy's name, and I don't have any ill will towards him. You know, the Lord spun it all around, and... And it, it turned out, uh, you know, very beneficial on, on, on my end. Um, but I just thought that that was amazing. You know, uh, a little over a year ago, we were praying for a guy that stole my truck. And uh, the Lord is faithful. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a, as a small testimony that if you have a loved one that, uh, that is in a difficult situation or if you have uh, loved ones that, that, that just aren't quite right with the Lord or even if you have enemies... Um, you know, the word of the Lord says to pray for your enemies, to pray for them. And it, this, then it would be like heaping coals of fire upon their heads. And I'm not trying to do that necessarily, but I mean, that, I think that spurs us on to pray for our enemies. Like, ha we'll get you. <laughs> but uh, so here we are a little more than a year later, and I get a phone call that says, uh, you know, Mike actually was going to beat this dude down, <laughs> uh, the guy that was in jail with him. You know, because who we all got friends in low places, right? And oh, you stole my buddy's truck. I'll show you. And uh, but in the midst of it, he he went on and he said, you know, this dude was getting ready to get in a fight, uh, you know, over this pickup, and he heard the word of the Lord say, uh, "Tell him about me." You know, and in a pretty shady situation, situation and circumstance, this dude gets saved. So, uh, just wanted to let you guys know: don't don't, don't give up. Um, pray. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Pray for your enemies. Pray for your friends. Pray for your families. For you never know. You never know when the Lord is going to answer your prayers. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of times it doesn't always happen immediately. A lot of times he tarries, you know. He has to um, allow situations and circumstances to unfold and to develop before he answers a prayer. But he's faithful and he's just and he loves us. And we, when we lift up our prayers, when we lift up our concerns to the Lord Almighty, if it concerns you, it concerns Him. And so I just wanted, wanted to say thank you, Lord, for, uh, for introducing yourself to this young man. In uh, Jesus' name. All right. Huh. <sighs> um, I'm just trying to get the jitters out. I'm, 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 a, I'm a little nervous, you know, those... Those people that are, that are closest to me know that I've been, uh, I've been going through it, especially since about the month of August, and, and hearing the Lord and, and trying to convey what the Lord is sharing with me and then missing, misconveying it and, and hurting feelings and, and, and you know, 
uh, the Lord is gracious. And uh, we, we do Wednesday night services here. And actually, over the course of the last couple Wednesdays, we've made reference to, uh, to Moses. You know, when the Lord called Moses and the burning bush to, uh, you know, be the, be the instrument to free uh, the Israelites from bondage in, in Egypt. Uh, you know, Moses had every excuse in the world. I can't do it. You picked the wrong guy. I stutter. I can't talk to him. And, um, and the, Lord, the Lord had grace for, uh, for Moses. And, uh, and then even Gideon, you know, the Lord showed up to Gideon and uh, said, hey, I want to I wanna use you. I want to partner with you to, uh, to win some battles, to win some wars here. And Gideon was like, Lord, you got the wrong guy. I mean, I'm like the weakest dude of the weakest, of the smallest tribe. Are you sure you know what you're doing? And uh, the Lord proved himself faithful to Gideon. And actually, when it was all said and done, he took Gideon from a massive army down to just 300 men and, uh, <laughs> and used, uh, you know, jars and horns to, to beat the enemy. <laughs> and, uh, but still, nonetheless, uh, the Lord wanted to partner with Gideon. And, uh, and Gideon had every excuse in the world as to why he shouldn't be that. And, um, and then even just this past Wednesday, we actually talked about uh, Ananias from the, in the story. I think it's Acts chapter 9 and, uh, and the Saul to Paul conversion. <sighs> and the Lord, uh, you know, the Lord told Ananias, um, gave him a vision and said, I want you to go to Straight Street and I want you to pray for a man named Saul of Tarsus. For I am going to show him what he must endure, and I'm going to show him that I want to that I want to partner with him as an instrument of uh, salvation to the Gentiles, and uh, and even Ananias was like, oh, Lord, this guy is killing Jews. I mean, this guy has uh, has warrants from from the Sanhedrin to to arrest. <laughs> you must got the this is wrong, Lord, and. Uh, and the Lord said, enough, do what I asked you to do. And Ananias said, okay. And I didn't know it then as we were going through all these stories, but I know it now that uh, over the last couple weeks I've been fighting against the Lord. It's not working for me. <laughs> I, I've been fighting against the Lord and sharing, telling him, going back and forth actually, that you got the wrong guy for this. Um, because... So some of the stuff that he is sharing with me is is difficult. It's uh, it's just difficult. It, it goes against my understanding. It goes against my theology. It goes against my thought processes. But I've been noticing and recognizing repetitively over and over and over, especially over the last three or four weeks, the Lord keeps bringing up Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. It's my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so the Lord keeps on sharing with me things, and I keep saying, Lord, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. <laughs> In fact, I quit. You can't make me do this. And it then reminds me of, uh, you know, Jonah and Nineveh. <laughs> and uh, so the Lord, you know, um, the Lord is faithful to himself. I mean, he's faithful to us as sons and daughters, but he's faithful to himself. And... Uh, you know, when you give your life to the Lord, it is exactly what it is. It is exactly what it says it is. I give my life to the Lord. My life is no longer my life, but now it is your life to live, to flow, to function through me. Lord, I give you permission to do with my life whatever it is that you see fit. Oh, Lord, <laughs> do we really count the costs before we make those statements? And then when he asks you to do something and we backpedal and he goes, ah, 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 ah. You remember the deal? You remember the deal we made, right? <laughs> now, that, that, that sounds heinous. It's, it's not that bad because in his grace and his mercy, he always equips us and gives us the strength and the courage to go through the things that he asks us to go through. Um, conveying his heart and not my own heart is what I'm struggling with. <laughs> and so, Lord, I ask for your grace and your mercy to be able to share your heart in the matter and I ask that you would separate myself from what it is that you are wanting to do and what it is that you are wanting to say. And I ask that in Jesus' mighty name. All right, so we have a lot of scriptures because I love scriptures. We have a lot of scriptures to go through. So uh, 
I, where's my friend, my friend Miss Becky, last night in the middle of the night, I finally got a title called The Reality of Duality. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm going to do my best to really stick to the notes. Um, yeah, this has been in process here for a while, and I've been in a chair for about four and a half hours, actually since, since 4.30 this morning, trying to put all this on paper, and you talk about rabbit trails. And you talk about scripture upon scripture, it is so difficult to just hone in the amount of material that the Lord gives you to make it applicable and, and palatable to, to, to a congregation or to a group of people. So we're going to start with Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 38. And uh, I'm going to read this out of, the, out of the New Living Translation. Hebrews chapter 10. Ten. Why do I always bring this Bible with the tiny print? <laughs> it's great for reading at home, not so great for up here. <laughs> uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses get out of 11, 35 through 38. It says, Do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord, no matter what happens. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now, so you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay, and a righteous person will live by faith. But I will have no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Um, now I underlined patient endurance, okay? Patient endurance. It says, do not throw away the confident trust in the Lord no matter what happens. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now. So you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And a righteous person will live by faith. But I will have no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Now, I could put myself in this particular scripture because as the Lord begins to share things with me and he asks me to share, I immediately find myself wanting to turn away and go, that's too hard, Lord. That's too hard to do. And he's telling me to, 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 to hold fast, to, to endure, to patiently endure. And, and, and that's easy to say. It's a little more difficult to do, to patiently endure. Okay, so that's what we opened with. I want you guys to put that in your pocket. And we're going to get back to that a little bit later. Okay? But today, we're going to, dis we're going to, discuss, some, we're going to discuss covenants and some things that I've been learning about covenants. Now, I believe that what I've come across is nine covenants in the Bible, okay? Covenant. Or what sometimes we, do, we, we dub or term testaments. Testaments, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. Covenants. They're, 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 they're slightly different, but they're really similar. And so uh, today we're going to discuss the covenants, and I believe that there's nine covenants in the Bible. Two covenants are made for all of humanity. That's the Adamic covenant found in Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to go through these. You can jot them down if you want. I'm not going to read all these. You have the Adamic, Adamic covenant found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 through 19. You have the Noahic, Noah, Noahic um, I went through this yesterday and I couldn't get it right either. Noahic, <laughs> Noahic, I don't know. The covenant with Noah. <laughs> the covenant with Noah was found in Genesis chapter 8, uh, verses 20 through uh, chapter 9, verse 13. And now those two covenants were for all of humanity, okay? And now you, we've had, we have seven other covenants that are to Abraham and his descendants, the Jewish people. Okay. You have the land covenant, which is found in Genesis 15. That's where the Lord, you know, set apart a piece of land for the Jewish people um, to have, which is what we would call Israel. And when it's funny is when the Jewish people are not there, that place is desolate desert. It is garbage ground. But when the Jewish people are there, it flourishes. It's like a, like a, I don't even know, you know, what is it called in the desert? When you see a little bit of water, oasis. It's like an oasis over there in the desert. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, so the land covenant is found in Genesis 15. Then you have the Abrahamic covenant found in Genesis 17. Then you have the Mosaic covenant found in Exodus 24. And then you have what's called the Marvel, the, 
like uh, to see uh, a miracle or to marvel at something. You have the Marvel Covenant found in Exodus 34. Then you have the Moabic Covenant found in Deuteronomy 29. You have the Davidic Covenant found in 2 Samuel uh, 7. And then we have what's called the New Covenant or what the Jewish people would actually call the Renewed Covenant found in Jeremiah 31 and also in Hebrews chapter 8. Okay. And the first thing that I want you guys to understand is that covenants are eternal. They're eternal. Covenants are eternal. Okay, it says in Psalm uh, 111, verse 9, it says, He sent redemption, redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The Lord's covenants are eternal. Okay? Um, today, we're going to focus just a little bit on the Mosaic covenant and the renewed covenant. Okay? The covenant of Moses and, and then, the, then the renewed covenant. Some, some things that I've been learning, you know, uh, the Mosaic covenant, a lot of times we refer to as the law. And then the new covenant or the renewed covenant, a lot of times we refer to Jesus, you know. And that, that would be rules and regulations as opposed to freedom and liberty, okay. So, before we get into that stuff, I'm going to uh, read a commentary that I found from what's called the complete, the complete Jewish Bible. This is a commentary from the Complete Jewish Bible, and um, what it's, the commentary is called The Nature of Covenant. And even how I got onto this thing, it's, it's from uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, and, and, uh, and uh, I've been to some, some Jewish uh, services, and they do this thing called the Shema, where before the service they stand up and they face the east, and, and then they, they have like this Jewish language that they speak, and then they speak it in uh, American language so that I can comprehend what's going on. And, and it kind of intrigued me. And, and, and in a nutshell, the Shema is recognizing that the Lord is one, that the Lord is one. He's over everything. He's in everything. And that, and that we, you know, he is our, our almighty. And so that's how I actually stumbled onto this thing. And then it just kind of came, you know, Covenants, the nature of covenant. And this is what it says. It, it really blessed my heart. It says, historically, the fundamental function of the covenant was to establish a community of interest between the king and his vessels. Covenant thus implies community, the forming of common customs, common views, and common life. This meant an intimate sharing of life, nature, and custom, where the wills of the contracting parties ultimately become identical. This commonness of will implied in the covenant showed that the parties had united for a common aim. They had become a part of close union. At its core, love forms the heart of the covenant relationship. The historical prologue of the covenant shows this quite clearly. It points to the gracious actions of the king prior to the covenant and then initiating it, which specifies this as the foundation of the relationship. There had been a powerful demonstration of Adonai, which is God. There had been a powerful demonstration of God's love seen in Exodus. Love and gratitude were to infect all of life and the thinking of those who were under the covenant. In fact, Deuteronomy uh, 5.11, I don't know if that's chapter 5, verse 11, or if that's chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. It says Deuteronomy 5.11 can be seen as an emphasis on wholehearted love toward God, with stress being laid not on the ability to do, but on the will to fulfill the covenant obligations. Okay, so Deuteronomy 6, 4, 6 is the Shema, Shema Israel, provides the classic expression of this wholehearted love, which was expected as Israel's Israel's response. The passage calls for exclusive devotion and commitment to God alone, a love expressed through one's entire being and personality. It also involves a total pattern of life. Thus, in Deuteronomy, while even in exile and judgment, Israel still enjoys God's promises of his love and his mercy. It is love, not law, that forms the core of covenant relationship between God and his people. Did you guys catch that? It's, it's not necessarily a, about doing what's right and what's wrong. It's the intent. It's the heart. It's the intent. You know, uh, so, I mean, 
<laughs> we had the, the law of Moses, which was to show us that we could not keep the holy ordinance of God. It was to show us our sin. See, and even in the law of Moses, that was the Lord's grace. Because for 2,448 years before the law of Moses, there was no law at all. We just had humanity living and doing whatever they wanted. We had Cain killing Abel. We had angels hooking up with humanity. We had just ridiculous going on all over the world. And it was only in the grace of the Lord that he decided to show us, hey, this stuff needs to change. And in showing us, the, the whole point of that was to show God's chosen people to the world. Now let me ask you a question. Can you tell the difference between the church and the world right now? Most of us can't. How come? It's because we don't choose to do the things the Lord asks us to do. He said, yeah, I want you to do these things, and it's going to show that you're set apart. You're a chosen people. You are my people. And we go, eh, okay. You know, the, the Lord's not going to encroach upon our will. He says, this is what I'm asking you to do. You don't have to do it, but I would like it if you would do it. If you would do it, you would represent my kingdom to the world. Okay? <sighs> hmm. So I seem to keep running into some discrepancies between the Mosaic Covenant, a.k.a. the Father's teachings, a.k.a. the Torah, or a.k.a. the Law of Moses. We have three different names that can all be applied to the same thing, which is the Mosaic Covenant. Depending on how you read it, it creates a whole different perception on what you think about the Mosaic Covenant. Because when I read it as Father's instructions, I'm like, whoa, well, I'd love to have that. When I read it as law, I'm like, I don't want that. So in a, in a simple interpretation of the way that we read the law or the Torah or the instructions of the Father completely changes our whole paradigm on what we perceive these words to be. Are you following me? So I keep running into some discrepancies of the Mosaic Covenant and then also the New or the Renewed Covenant, a.k.a. Liberty or a.k.a. Freedom from the Law. Are you understand? Are you following me? Is everybody following me? Okay. If you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. If your Bibles are still open, we started in Hebrews 10, so it's just going to be like two pages over. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, it says, But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds so they will understand them, and I will write them on their hearts so they will obey them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. See, the whole purpose of the covenant, whether it's the Mosaic covenant or the renewed covenant, is to show that, that, that the Adonai is our God and that we are his people. That is the whole purpose of the covenant. It isn't to put us under some crazy bondage, and it isn't to give us some crazy freedom to do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want. So the whole purpose of, this, of these two particular covenants is for us to be representatives that he will be our God and we are his people, okay? Okay. So the author of Hebrews is unknown, but it's thought to be Paul. And the author of Hebrews in, in this uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, he's actually referring or referencing Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 through 34. I'm going to turn over there. Keep, make that marker stay there. Now, Jeremiah 31... Jeremiah 31, it's, I'm sorry, 31 through 33. It says, The day will come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. For they broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. And, uh, huh. Again, again um, I've been learning a, a style of breaking the Bible down and interpreting it called hermeneutics. And, and there is an a authoritative value placed on the different books of the Bible where there's 
what we call scripture, and then there's what we call passages. Um, and the only reason I'm looking into some of this stuff is because what the Jewish people call scriptures, I call scriptures everything. I call scripture, you know, from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, they're all scriptures. And the Jewish people don't do that. And the religion that I'm involved with is Jesus being my Lord and Savior, was he was a Jew. And so you have these Jewish people who kind of have these different understandings and they have these Jewish idioms that I don't fully comprehend and I don't fully understand, but I'm trying to understand them because I'm looking for a deeper relationship with my Lord and my Savior. <sighs> so with all of that being said, we don't know who the author in Hebrews is, but he is referring back to what they call the Holy Scriptures. You know, and... um. And, <laughs> Lord help me. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. And the, I'm beginning to see discrepancies in a few, I don't even know, maybe a year or so ago, I did a Wednesday night service on something really similar called duality. And it's where there's, I keep finding these things in the Bible which say something but mean something else. That would, what I'm figuring out now is an idiom, is an idiom. And, um... You know, so, <laughs> uh, so what was going on is the author of Hebrews was actually referencing what they call the Holy Scriptures by going back to Jeremiah, which was actually pointing to this new covenant that was going to be fulfilled in, you know, it was the fulfillment of it was when Yeshua came and, and, and he died, you know, and he gave his life, death, burial, and resurrections. Uh, he was the ultimate sacrifice, doing away with the sacrificing of the of the the bulls and the goats. And, uh, you know, he was the pure uh, lamb of God that was the eternal sacrifice for our sins. And, and, and I'm, learning, I'm learning that maybe it's just me. I get things a little mixed up sometimes that the whole purpose of this perfect sacrifice was in order for me, able, for me to even uh, be grafted into this Jewish religion and for me to then begin to try to represent the Lord to the world. Before the Messiah came and did that, we didn't even get the opportunity. You know, the people of uh, the Hebrews, when they were set free um, from, from Egypt in Exodus, they didn't even get the opportunity. Before that, when they was in bondage, they never even had the opportunity to represent the Lord. There was not even an opportunity for them to be God's chosen people, you know. And, and I am a Gentile. I'm not a Jewish person. And so I have been grafted into this Jewish root through Jesus, the Messiah. And so I'm beginning to try to do research further back to try to understand this Messiah that I th think I'm familiar with. And the more I study, the more I'm figuring out I'm not near as familiar with this guy that I thought that I was familiar with, which is really messing me up which is really ma making me go, Lord, you got the wrong guy for this. <laughs> Who am I to stand up here and say anything when I don't even know what I'm doing? I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know what I'm finding. I don't understand it. Can you please help me? And he goes, aha, you're the perfect knucklehead for the job. <laughs> hey, um, knucklehead might be off base, but that's just me. Um, and then what's wild is, is Jeremiah 31, uh, 31 through 34 was actually a prophecy fulfilled See, Moses prophesied this in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 31, verses 28 through 29, um, this is just before, actually, Moses was pack, passing the torch to Joshua. And at the very end of all of it, before Moses uh, sang the song, he, he, he uh, here, I'm just going to turn over there and read it because I'm just stumbling. I'm so nervous. Why am I nervous? Because I don't want to get it wrong. Because, because I've broke hearts and my lack of understanding and forcefully trying to share with people what I don't fully understand and it causes a lot of ridiculousness. So Deuteronomy 31, 28 through 29. Man, and my eyeballs are leaking too. Whew. Out of the New Living Translation it says, now this is Moses. He says, Now summon all the leaders and the officials of your tribe so that I can speak to them and call heaven and earth to witness against them. 
I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt and will turn from the path I have commanded you to follow. In the days to come, disaster will come down on you, and you will make the Lord very angry by doing what is evil in his sight. So this is at the very end, you know, when Moses done wrote the book of the law or wrote the instructions of the Father or wrote the Torah, and he gave it to the people, and he told them before he ever even passed the torch to Joshua, you guys are going to fail. You guys are going to fail at this, and it's going to require a renewed covenant. Not that the covenant, not that anything was wrong with the covenant. Nothing was wrong with the covenant outside of humanity. Uh, I just want to ask a question. This is a question that I ask myself that I still don't have a full answer for, that I'm trying to come to the answer. But if you want to go, you don't have to go there. I just, just when we read in, in Hebrews chapter 8, you know, he says, I will make a new covenant. You know what I'm saying? I will write, I will put, their, put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts so that they can obey it. If something was broken with the Mosaic covenant, why would he then write it on our hearts and put it in our minds? I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out. If it was so broken and he wants to do away with it, then why would he write it on our hearts and on our minds? So, uh, these are just some questions that I'm stumbling through and trying to figure some things out. And the Lord, um, the Lord so graciously took me over to 2 Kings in uh, chapter 22 and 23. And, uh, and what was also was the same exact story as referenced in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and 35. And that sent me on a whole other thing uh, of learning that... Uh, <laughs> That Kings and Chronicles are, are, are <laughs> they're basically the same thing, written by two different two different people. You know, uh, you got one. The Book of Kings is actually uh, written by a prophet, and then you got the Book of Chronicles. Uh, the point of view is coming from a priest. But uh, the whole story of Second Kings twenty two and twenty three is that uh, you know that you had a whole bunch of bad kings, and then there was this uh, king who was assassinated, and then his eight year old boy became the king. Could you be, imagine being a king at eight years old? Whoo, kid in the candy store. Anywho, <laughs> at eight years old, uh, Josiah became the king. And, uh, and as, you know, as he goes through a little bit of uh, time, he gets a little bit older. Um, the, the, the temple had been destroyed, and all these kings were uh, involved with idol worship before him. These kings before him were involved with idol worship. Um <sighs> And he sends uh, Hilkiah the priest to go and to begin restoring the, uh, the temple. And Hilkiah the high priest discovers the Torah, or he discovers the book of law, or he discovers the, uh, the father's instructions. And Hilkiah returned the Torah, or the book of law, to King uh, Josiah. And King Josiah applies the Torah. He applies it. He finds it. And the first thing he does is, is he, has, he has it read to him. And the first thing he does is he tears his, he tears his, his whatever you call it, his man skirt, his uh, robe. <laughs> he tears his robe and he begins repenting to the Lord and goes, I had no idea. I had no idea that, that we weren't following your ways. We were doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so he goes into repentance. And then he immediately begins applying uh, the book of law or the Torah, or again, um, you know, the Father's instructions. And as soon as they begin applying it, the Lord tells him, he goes, you know, I was going to judge, uh, I was going to judge Judah again. I was going to judge them. But because you were repentant, I am going to not judge them until you die. So while you're alive and you're trying to do the right thing and you're getting rid of all of this all of the ridiculous sacrifices and the Asherah poles and, and, and the, the uh, Mela, or Baal and Malak and all these sacrificing of children. As you're trying to clean up all of that stuff, I'm going to hold back judgment upon you. And uh, I just thought that that was really wild. I just thought that that was really wild that when we are in a nation right now of what? Lawlessness lawlessness. And what do we call the Torah? The law. 
But what is the Torah? It's just instructions. We live in a nation that is rebelling against the instructions. We live in a nation that is rebelling against the rules and the regulations, the laws, and we are dealing with the consequences of that. And <laughs> same thing here with these people in Second Kings, as the Lord is about to hand out the consequences of the decisions that they made. But there was a man who found the rules and the regulations. And he tried to apply them. And the Lord relented. The Lord relented. And it makes me think about where we are right now. I'm getting way ahead of myself. I'm starting to go just off of a bunch of memory now. (laughs) Is what happened with Josiah was what the Bible calls the spirit of Elijah that was in function through John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1. The spirit of Elijah, the spirit, of, the spirit and power of Elijah functioned through John the Baptist. And what was John the Baptist's call? It was to make straight the path for the Lord. Repent. He was making straight a path for the Lord, and he was telling the people, repent. That is the spirit of Elijah. That's the same thing that this guy Josiah was doing. That's the same thing that we should actually be doing. Still. We just came out of a repentant season, but I think that we should still be repenting. (sighs) Repentance, restoration comes on the back of repentance. It's only when you repent that you can be restored. When we repent for our nation, for the sins of our nation, when we repent for the abortions, when we repent, for the legalizing of gay marriage, when we repent for these things, then the Lord can restore us and redeem us. But until we do, He's a just God. He is going to release judgment. You know, I think it says in Matthew 25 that just like in the days of Noah, just like in the days of Noah, we're going to be having marriages. We're going to be partying like rock stars. We're going to be doing everything just like they were doing all the way up until the time of the flood. That's what we're going to be doing in humanity before the great and terrible day of the Lord. As Messiah comes back <laughs> to be crowned king of the world <laughs> before the thousand year rule and reign, the millennial, we're going to be going about life as usual. And when he shows up, it's going to be surprising. You know, something else that we keep on talking about, that I keep hearing or keep catching a pattern of, is the story of the ten virgins. You know, five will be ready with oil and five won't be. And, and I just want to share with you guys that you have to cultivate your own oil. I, I, I mean, I'm trying to give to you guys right now my oil that I've cultivated. And I hope that, some, I, hope that I can give it away. I'm trying my best to give away that the, oil, the oil that the Lord is sharing with me. But you've got to cultivate your own. You just absolutely have to. So, uh, man, all these little, this little sidebar for the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles. The book of Kings was written at the beginning, the beginning of their captivity in Babylon. The book of Chronicles was written after they turned from, from Babylon. Um, the emphasis on kings was earthly, but the emphasis on chronicles is heavenly. Um, both Israel and Judah are the theme of kings, where in chronicles only Judah is the main theme. The history of the book of Kings is political and focuses just on the kings. The history of chronicles is ecclesiastical, which is church, that's the ecclesia, and it focuses on the priests. Um, The book of Kings closes with bondage in a forged land, and the book of Chronicles closes with restoration from foreign oppressors. So it's pretty cool. Maybe it's just me. I liked. I read them both. You know what I mean. And to see how one, to see this one set of stories through the lens of 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 a prophet, but then read basically the same stories through the lens of a priest for me was cool. Um. Now with 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 all of these things, and with uh, with applying. With Josiah applying the Torah or the law or the Father's teachings, and then the Lord holding back 
uh, judgment until after he passed. It, the Lord, I feel like the Lord took me to uh, first, first Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, where it says, we are now the temple. We are now the temple. And in my notes, it says, read it. So that means I need to turn over to there. <laughs> you guys don't have to, but I'm, I'm going to. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. It says, Or don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. Ah, oh, there's the Lord reiterating that to me. I mean, this, I don't want to take this scripture, this, there he is again. I don't want to take this passage <laughs> out of context. Uh, this is actually all talking about avoiding sexual sins, and I believe that this is actually the chapter where it talks about soul ties, and you should not, you know, a person should not be uh, in union with a prostitute for a piece of your soul becomes theirs and a piece of their soul becomes yours. Um, but the Lord was really just highlighting to me that my body is the temple in which the Holy Spirit lives, that I am not my own. Just like they had the law or the Torah in their temple, we have the law or the Torah within us written upon our hearts. Isn't that what Hebrews chapter 8 said? The thing is how do you apply that? How do you apply that without being in bondage? See, there's a difference between wanting to serve the Lord out of the love of your heart and having to do it. See, I find myself now wanting to do things for the Lord that some of my Christians and brothers and sisters say that I got it all wrong. I'm trying to go back into bondage, and I'm trying to go under the law. And I'm trying to explain, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. I'm not under any bondage. I totally understand that the grace of God, that my, my reconciliation to God only comes through Jesus. But I'm doing this out of adoration of my Father. What if it, 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 all of us in here got earthly fathers, I think? And what if your dad said to do something? Would you do it? At first, 10 years ago, I wouldn't out of rebellion. But now that I'm just a little bit older, I want to honor my father and my mother. Is that not one of the Ten Commandments? Honor your mother and your father. It's the first commandment with the blessing. It says, then you will be blessed with a long life. Honor your mother and father. See, I don't do it out of obligation. I want to do it out of love. Um, if you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. See, this, this is a reiteration again of Jeremiah 31. It says, This is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts so they will understand them, and I will write them on their minds so they will obey him, so they will obey them. So again, I find myself asking the question, if you were doing away with the Mosaic covenant, why would you write those laws on my mind and in my heart? It's not about obligation and bondage. It's because he's a good father. I also then I have uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. Now this is definitely Paul. See, we think that Paul wrote Ephesians, but we're not for sure. But... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. In Hebrew, I'm sorry. Hebrews, we think that... Thank you, Susie. That's right, no problem. We think that Hebrews was written by Paul, but we don't know that for sure. So, uh, but we do know that Romans was written by Paul. So Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 14 through 15, it says, Even when Gentiles who do not have God's written law instinctively follow that law, they show that in their hearts they know right from wrong. They demonstrate that God's law is written within them. For their own consciousness either, either accuses them and tells them that they are doing what is right or what is wrong. I feel like for me, 
I can't say for you, but for me, I feel like the Lord is beginning to show me, you know, this whole thing that the law wasn't given to the Gentiles. You know, if you go back to where we was talking about the covenants, there were two covenants that were given to all of humanity, and then there were seven covenants that were given to the, to the Jewish people, okay? Well, this thing right here, you know, Paul is saying that, that the Gentiles, which is me, I can prove that the law has been written on my heart when I follow these things. You know, um, the, whole, the whole being grafted in to <laughs> the vine means I'm going to take on his attributes. It doesn't mean that I'm grafted into the vine to live like a heathen. That's just for me. That's the way I perceive it. That's the way I, I interpret it. You know, um, I would recommend you guys to take a look at it and interpret it on your own. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would give my brothers and sisters the interpretation that you want them to have. Um, see, it's only when the Spirit of the Lord breathes life onto these words that are written within our hearts do they become living and ready to be applied in our lives. See, he wrote all of the stuff. He wrote all of, all of the 613 laws. They're all written on our hearts and they're stored in our minds. But it's only when he breathes on them that they become even applicable. They're kind of laying dormant. <laughs> See, I went years and years and years doing my best with what I thought. And then the more I, more I spend time with the Lord, the more he reveals himself to me. And every time what we've been teaching... Um, you know, on Wednesday night is whenever the Lord reveals himself to you, it usually puts, actually, I said always, always. When the Lord reveals himself to you, gives you a revelation, it always creates a crisis in your thought process. When the Lord reveals himself to you, it causes you to be forced to make a decision. Is what the Lord just told me real? And if it is real, or if it isn't real, that decision's up to each person individually, in order to continue walking with the Lord, it's going to cause us to have to make major adjustments to our lifestyles. How many of us in here give our life to the Lord, and the more, the more we walked with the Lord, the more he said, yeah, that's not going to work no more. <laughs> you can't have three girlfriends. That's not how that works. <laughs> You're going to do it the way I want you to do it. Now, I could cling to my three girlfriends, but I'm not going to keep walking with the Lord. Or I can get rid of my three girlfriends and get one wife and then walk with the Lord. Either way, I'm going to conform to his ways in order to be part of his kingdom. Why is this so important? I, believe, I really believe that I believe that I believe. I've been catching warning after warning after warning. I hear my, all my brothers, all my friends, everything I listen to is warning. Something's coming, something's coming, something's coming. So, you want me to tell you what's coming? The kingdom of God is coming. That's what's coming. It has nothing to do with doom and gloom. The kingdom of God is coming. There's scripture, uh, there's passage, <laughs> there's passage that says, Jesus is going to give the kingdom back to his father. When the Lord shows up, we're going to make some major adjustments. See, Ananias argued with the Lord and said, Lord, I don't want to go pray for Saul of Tarsus. He's killing people. And me, myself, go, Lord, I don't want to follow your rules. They're for the Jews. And what did the Lord say to Ananias? Enough. Go pray for him. That's what's going to happen when the Lord shows up. The grace time is over. That's what's coming. It's nothing to be afraid of. Because also what we talked about, or I didn't, <laughs> us, we, uh, awesome rod, was uh, making reference to Exodus, and even, even before that, you know, uh, the, the plagues that were going on in Exodus were catastrophic and devastating to the Egyptian people. But to the Jewish people, they were wonders. So depending on which side of the coin you're looking at, this can be really horrible, or this could be really awesome. I'm like, come on, Lord, come on, come on, come on. And a lot of people are like, no, 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 no. Malachi chapter 4. 
I'm really, really, really trying to stick to my notes. I'm gonna. I'm sticking to my notes. It reminds me when, when, before, when this Rona all thing, when all this thing all started, we was, I, was, I was stuck in the book of Haggai and what the Lord was doing. The Lord was renewing his church. The Lord was renewing his church. He was redoing it all. You know, we focus on ourselves, these big lavish houses, and the Lord said, what are you guys doing? I told you to build my kingdom, and you guys just build big fancy churches for yourself, and the kingdom is flailing. And the Lord says, I'm, I'm going to, he, he, he holds the plumb line of Zerubbabel and says, no, 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 we're going to get some things in order here. Remember? You guys remember when I was talking about Haggai? Let's go to Malachi chapter 4. This blows me away too is when a totally different, you know, the uh, Malachi chapter 4 is not even in the Jewish Bible, which is another thing that rocks me. All these different translations have different verse settings, and some things are there, and some things aren't. And Anywho, I just want to read this to you guys, okay? I'm going to read it all, Malachi chapter 4, it's not that long. The Lord Almighty says, The day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. The arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw on that day. They will be consumed like a tree, roots and all. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healings in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves, led out to pasture. On that day when I act, you will tread upon the wicked as if they were dust under your feet, says the Lord Almighty. Remember too, obey the instructions of my servant Moses, all the laws and the regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all of Israel. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. That's the word of the Lord. That's what we're upon. Some of the stuff that I'm learning is shocking me. Absolutely shocking me. Like, what is going on? <laughs> These are the things that are coming. If you want to get down to the nitty gritties of some teachings, it says, you know, in the Hebraic, you were in the year 5781. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of scholars, a lot of Jewish sages, they believe that the millennial is going to happen here when we strike the year 6000. And there's even other teachings that say that we're in the year 5981, which means in the next 10 years it could happen. I'm like, whoa, the grateful and terrible day of the Lord is like that close? There's a lot of things we're still looking for, still watching for, you know. In the feasts of the Jewish people that the Lord says to recognize and to look at and to honor. My whole life I thought I didn't have to pay no attention to that. I'm not a Jew. And the Lord goes, are you grafted in or not? And I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> and he says, look, Jesus fulfilled the spring feast, but the fall feast has not yet been fulfilled. Don't you think you better do some research to figure out? If I laid out the pattern and showed you where Jesus was going to come to fulfill the spring feast, don't you think you should go back and take a look at what's coming? Because the fall feast has yet to be fulfilled. Things I'm just looking into. I don't have a definitive answer. But I can tell you there's an urgency in my spirit. that <laughs> The Lord is setting some things in order. And it's good that he does it now when we have the opportunity to change our thought processes. Because when he shows up and we're at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of God, it's not going to be an option. He's going to say, hey, what's going on? And I'm like, well, my, my, my pastor said. And he goes, what do you mean your pastor said? We're in the information age. We have access to every bit of information that could possibly fathom. We have the best of both worlds living as Gentiles. We get to worship the Lord in spirit, and we get access to the truth. Not one or the other. The Lord's not going to go, your pastor, I didn't ask your pastor. I asked you. You are my son. You are my daughter. What are we going to say? I bet we won't even be able to drop the words out of our mouth, my pastor said. Whew, calm down. Calm down. So I think that it's funny that I get ahead of myself sometimes. In uh, Malachi 4, verse 5, it says, Look, I'm sending you the prophet of Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. <laughs> Remember what I just said? What, what is the prophet of Elijah? 
The spirit of repentance. It's the spirit of repentance. Our repentance is only holding back the judgment that's coming. Just like Josiah. The judgment was coming. But the dude started repenting and the Lord said, tell you what. I'm going to hold off till you die. But when you die, my wrath is coming. Hallelujah. Uh, so uh, I really think that I think that repentance is good. I used to not like repentance at all. I, I had an amazing friend who talked about repentance a lot. And it, before I got it, I was like, man, I already got the blood of Jesus. I mean, what are we going to repent for? How much repentance can we do? And now I get it. Now I get it. You can repent for other things and hold back the judgment of the Lord upon people. Is not loving your neighbor as yourself, but that does not, not kind of go hand in hand. You know, I don't want you to be hurt. I want you to come to... I didn't want that guy, that, that guy that stole my truck. I wanted to smash him. Let me tell you. But I died to myself and I asked the Lord to save his soul. And a year later, he encountered the Lord. That wasn't me. Huh. Anyway, uh, if you guys can turn with me, Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19. Whoa. <laughs> Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 12. I am jealous of you guys with all your phones that are like, click, click, I'm here. Uh, Psalms chapter 19, verses 7 through 12, okay? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. I'm just going to pause there. And we're going to keep going. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight to life. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to those who hear them. There is a great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Now, I can't put this on y'all, but I can put it on me. There was a time when I ran from anything that even kind of considered the law. There was a time when I was a criminal where I definitely ran from the law. <laughs> but then the Lord started to reveal to me what we, what I have always been taught in, in church, the law was a form of bondage. And now I'm learning that they're only instructions from the Father. They're actually good. They're good to have boundaries. Does anybody in here like football or baseball? What happens if you guys watched a football game and at the end of a fourth down, they didn't give the ball to the other team? Because they make their own rules. See, within that football game, if you operate within the boundaries of the rules set, you're free to do whatever you want. But you don't do whatever you want and make your own rules. What about baseball? The guy strikes out on three pitches and he goes, nope, I got two more coming. Is that going to work? I'm trying to figure this out. I do not have the answers. But I do know that there's something that's coming. There's something that's happening that's different. It's no longer law of bondage. It's, it's, it's instruction revered through adoration. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, so I wanted to, again, uh, Psalm 19, uh, 7, it starts out with the law is perfect. Now I can say the Torah is perfect. I can say the instructions of the Father is perfect. It's all in translation, I'm telling you, will determine how your mind interprets that. 
I'm going to read this little thing I wrote. King David teaches that the Torah, or the law, is perfect. Now, this is all, rega- this is all out of and regarding uh, you know, Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 12. King David teaches that the Torah, the law, is perfect. It's meant to display God's revealed will, his revealed will, and aspects of his divine nature. Torah, or the law, is not just a list of rules one must follow. For as pure light, it emanates from God himself and is given with both precision and authority. Fear and reverence are the correct response to God's holy instructions. His word stands firm and cannot be shaken. The only flaw in the Mosaic Covenant was not the law, but it was with humanity, not keeping our end of the covenant, which required a renewed covenant where only through Jesus our Messiah can we fulfill the law of the Torah. Did you guys follow that? With what we could not do on our own, the Lord provided somebody that could help us with that. Okay? That doesn't mean... Because what are covenants? They're eternal. It doesn't mean that he did away with. I'm really struggling with the end of Romans chapter 8. I'll let you guys look at it yourselves. And I'm like, how is this? I'm having all these uh, short circuits where what I thought I knew, I'm, the Lord is challenging. And I'm trying to press in. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for you guys. Those of you that know, I've come unhinged on a few, and I've had to ask for forgiveness, and the Lord is restored and redeemed because, because in my um, amateurness, <laughs> I've made some pretty good follies. But by golly, I'm going to swing for it. I'd rather swing for it and make a mistake and have to say, man, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Instead of sitting on my hump and never even making an effort. I want to close, guys, with uh, Revelation fourteen twelve. I really want you guys to hear, hear, hear again that where we was coming from when, when the Rona started back in uh, March with, uh, you know, the book of Haggai. Please take a look at it. Please take a look at the book of Haggai. And then please take a look at Malachi chapter 4. The Lord is bringing things. He, 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 he doesn't do nothing with announcing it to his prophets. And I'm not saying that I'm a prophet. I'm saying that if you just look and listen to the people, that what the people are saying, what the overall theme is of what the Lord is doing, and it's everybody prepare, get ready, prepare, get ready. And I think we may be misinterpreting it with food, ammunition, and water. <laughs> Toilet paper. I think we may be misinterpreting it. I think the Lord cares a little bit more about our spiritual level, our spiritual lives that are going to be with him for eternity as opposed to this flesh, this dirt suit that we get, what, 70, 80, 90, 100 years out of? And you guys all turned there and I didn't because I just kept on talking. I know what it says, but I want to read it. Remember, I want you to get in your pocket from the very first thing that we said. Okay, remember the very first thing we said? This now is what we need, the patient endurance. You remember when I started, opened up with that and said, put that in your pocket. Okay? It was... Uh, Where in the world? It was Hebrews chapter 10, 35 through 38 was the patient endurance. And now here we are in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It says, let this encourage God's holy people to endure persecution patiently, remain firm to the end, obeying his commandments and trusting in Jesus. Have I'm not saying y'all. I'm going to back up and say Scott has. Scott has traditionally separated the two. You're either all with Jesus or you're all with the Torah. You're either all with Jesus or you're all with the commands. I've heard it preached my whole life that if you break one of the commands, you've broken all of the commands. If you, you're going to go back under the law of Moses, you, you, you're, you're, tre- you're treading on the blood of Jesus, you're slapping him in the face when you try to go back. No, 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 I think we missed it. 
I think I missed it. I can't say y'all did nothing. I missed it. The whole one new man that the Lord is doing, the one new man, the Jew and the Gentile, he's unifying them. You know, he says that I'm going to use the Jew, or I'm going to use, um, excuse me, I'm going to use the Gentile to provoke the Jew to jealousy. What's that going to look like when he brings us into unity? Because us Gentiles, ah, there we go again. Scott Gentile, not us. Scott Gentile loves to worship the Lord in spirit, but lacks a little bit of the truth. And the Jews love to worship the Lord in truth, but they lack a little bit of the spirit. And I'm telling you, the Lord is going to bring it together because it says the true worshipers of the Lord must worship the Lord in truth and spirit. You following me? And this whole revelation right here, it says, you know, the whole God's holy people, this is, this is, the, this is the patient endurance right here. With it, we remain firm to the end, obeying his commands and trusting in Jesus. See, here at the end, at the end of the book, John the Revelator brings the two together. It's not a separate thing. And I'm telling you, that's what's on the forefront. The Lord is restoring the Jew and the Gentile into one man because his kingdom is coming to the earth. We're at the very end of time. We are at the end of days. The great and terrible day of judgment is coming. The great and terrible day of the Lord. How is it great and terrible? Because, because if it's great for those of you that are in Messiah, and it's terrible for those of you that are not. Think about it. When the Lord's kingdom comes to earth and we think we got it figured out, and we're sideswiped, that's going to be difficult. And remember, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, His ways are not our ways, His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways, His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Listen, if we can't pin it down in text, we need to reevaluate it. And a lot of the things we do pin down in text, we need to reevaluate too. Because we have access to information now that we didn't have before. So much is making sense to me. I just stumbled across a prof prophetic word that came across and uh, that came through this church. It was in uh, October, October 8th of 2018, which is just a couple years. What are we? We're at October 20th, 2020 now. It said culture transformation. Culture transformation. The Lord is bringing forth culture transformation. And I, and I totally was wholeheartedly set on the fivefold ministry apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. It was all that stuff, and I think that stuff is all happening. But I, th I think in, in it, the other, some other prophetic words, we're going to go back to the future. Do you guys remember that? The Lord says we're going to go back in order to propel ourselves into the future. All of these different little prophetic words that come forth out of this church, now the Lord is starting to go. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? It's getting serious now. And I'm like, whoa, did I miss it? And he's like, eh, you might be a little more familiar with me than you might want to do some research. Digging in, youngster. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to dig in. I'm going to dig in. And the more I dig in, the more scared I get. <laughs> Doesn't Solomon say to increase with knowledge is to increase sorrow? Whoa! Now I understand that. Whew. Anyways, I, I didn't mean this to be a bubble buster in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I, I love it. I love it that Revelation, we can close with that where he says, let this encourage God's holy people. Let this encourage you. This isn't a, this isn't a chop buster. This is just please reevaluate some things. It, 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 is, it was never, the, the good, good father was never about putting his children in bondage. It was about setting us apart so that we could represent him to the world. <sighs> Can we pray? Lord Jesus. I ask for your help in this. I ask for your help delivering this. Lord, I ask that it would stick. Lord, I ask that you would open the eyes of our heart. I ask that you would open our minds, Heavenly Father. I help, ask that you would help us to press into you. Lord, your ways aren't our ways and your thoughts aren't our thoughts. But we do have the mind of Christ. So we're asking for you to reveal your truth to us. Holy Spirit, breathe on the words that you've written in our hearts. Help us to obey you, Lord, out of adoration. 
Lord, help us to get those ready that we love. Help us to be, help us to advance your kingdom. Help us to be your hands and feet, Lord. Lord, help us to function in the spirit of Elijah. Help us to make straight the way of the Lord before you come back to earth. Lord, help us. Help us to repent, Lord. I ask that you would bring to our memories things that we need to repent for. Lord, I repent for our nation. I repent for this nation. For the desecration of that which you've called holy, and that's marriage between a man and a woman. Lord, I repent on behalf of our nation for the 60 plus million abortions that we've had. Lord, I repent for misinterpreting your word. I ask that you would get me back on track. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you. Lord, we pray for this election that's coming up. Lord, we ask that you would put the man in there that you want in there. Lord, we just bind up the lies. We just silence the lies and the attacks of the enemy right now in Jesus' name. And we just call forth truth, integrity, honesty. Lord, we ask that you would restore to this nation what it once was, a great nation, to be admonished and admired. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us to, to, to fulfill the plans and the purposes. Lord, you birthed this nation, and we ask that you would help us to fulfill your purposes for this nation. Lord, we love you. Lord, we just release blessings and protection over everybody under the sound of my voice. Lord, that they would go throughout their week, Lord, and that you would illuminate these words, that you would water these seeds, Heavenly Father, that you would fertilize them, that you would bring forth fruit, fruit, Heavenly Father. We humbly ask that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.